let's take a look at more realistic behavior in circuits. So we're going to look at six different topics in this video. First is going to be wires. So, so far we've thought about wires as being made of electrical conductors, so like copper or aluminum, and we've said that electrons can easily move through them. And so far we've assumed that they allow electrons to move through them with no resistance. But that's not strictly true. In reality, wires provide a small resistance. And one way to think about this is, let's go back to our idea of a wire right here. So here's a wire, let's say it's made out of copper, so it's full of copper atoms. And ideally, we think about the electrons as just kind of drifting through the wire. They move like berries floating on the surface of a river, right? They drift smoothly and through as the current drifts them along. Okay. In reality, of course, it's messier than that. It's more like the game Plinko, if you've ever seen The Price is Right. And if you haven't, I'll provide a link in the description of this video. So imagine that you have this wire. Here's these atoms inside there, copper atoms, if it's a copper wire. The electrons bounce off of those atoms as they drift through. They don't just pass by smoothly. The copper atoms interfere with the electrons as they drift through. One way to think about this interference is that as the electrons are moving through the wire and they interact with these copper atoms, they kind of bounce off of them, just like the pucks in the Plinko game. And when they bounce off of them, they kind of go backwards. But there is an electric field, so the electrons do eventually drift in the direction of all the other electrons. But the point is that the copper atoms in there provide some small resistance to the flow of electrons through the wire. You know, in an average wire that's made out of copper or aluminum, copper and aluminum atoms don't interact and don't interfere with the electrons very much. But it is noticeable. And it's noticeable, especially if you have, say, a very, very long wire, or if you have a very high current. If you have a very long wire, say, like the wire between an electrical source, like a power plant, and a home, that long wire means that there's a lot of copper atoms in the path that the electron is traveling. And so, even though that wire may be made out of a material where the atoms don't interact with the electrons very much, if it's a very long wire, there's still a lot of opportunities for interactions to occur and for a resistance to have an impact. If you have a very high current in your wire, that means there's many, many electrons passing through the wire. And so that small interference, right? Every electron has very little probability of interacting with a single atom. But if there's so many electrons, then there will be an effect on that current. Now, this argument has been kind of hand-waving, is what we would say in physics. It's been qualitative and just kind of talking about ideas. Let's get a little more quantitative. Let's talk about something called resistivity. So let's consider a resistor. So we got a perfect wire coming in. Here's our little resistor, model it as a cylinder. And then we got a wire going out. And we're going to make this resistor a length L, cross-sectional area A, and it's made out of some material. So the electrons move from one side of the resistor to the other. And there's atoms in this resistor that interfere with the electrons as they flow through. So let's think about this. How would altering the length of the resistor affect the resistance? So if I had a longer resistor, there's a longer path for those electrons to travel through. So the electrons will encounter more atoms as they pass through this resistor. And those atoms are interfering with the electrons, so this should have greater resistance. In essence, the longer the resistor, the greater the resistance. So the resistance is proportional to the length of the resistor. Now what if the length is the same, but we increase the cross-sectional area of the resistor? So there's a wider path here. So that means that there's more ways for the electron to move from one end of the resistor to the other, which means that it's going to decrease the resistance of the resistor. So if we make the resistor wider, then we're going to have less resistance. In this case, the resistance is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area of the resistor. And the other thing that's going to affect the resistance is the material of the resistor. If the material interferes with the electrons more, then the resistance is going to increase. That would be more like an insulator. And if the material interferes less with the electrons as they pass through, then the resistance is going to be smaller. That would be more like a conductor. 
So the way that we quantify this is with an idea called resistivity. Resistivity is a measure of how much a material interferes with the charge carrier electrons in the current. And the symbol we use for this is a lowercase rho. A little frustrating because that's also density. And the unit of resistivity is the ohm meter. We'll see why in a little bit. So let's say we have this continuum here. Over here we're going to have things with low resistivity. Over here we're going to have materials with high resistivity. Over here with low resistivity we have electrical conductors. So say copper and aluminum. And copper has a resistivity of 1.68 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. Aluminum 2.65 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. So very small resistivities. Over here on the high resistivity side we have electrical insulators. So say rubber. Rubber has a resistivity of about 10 to the 13 ohm meters. And air has a resistivity of about 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 15 ohm meters. Depends on the conditions in the air. But you can see there's a huge variation in resistivity between conductors and insulators. And in between we have these things called semiconductors. So for example, silicon. Silicon has a resistivity of about 2300 ohm meters. And germanium has a resistivity of about 0.46 ohm meters. And if resistivity is a measure of how much the material interferes with the electrons as they pass through, you can imagine that a greater resistivity means a greater resistance in the resistor. So if you bring all of these ideas together, the resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length divided by the cross-sectional area of the resistor. And this equation includes all of the three ideas that we just talked about. The resistance is proportional to the length, the resistance is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area, and the resistance is proportional to the resistivity. Now in your data booklet you get a slightly altered version of this. If we solve for the resistivity we get resistivity is equal to the resistance of the resistor times the cross-sectional area of the resistor divided by the length of the resistor. Okay. From this equation we can see what the units of the resistivity are. If you look, resistance has units of ohms, cross-sectional area has units of meters squared, length has units of meters, so if we simplify that we get that resistivity has units of ohm meters. Now let's look at Ohm's law. So it's often said that V equals IR or R equals V over I is Ohm's law, but that's not strictly correct. Ohm's law is this statement. Ohm's law is that the potential difference across a metallic conductor is proportional to the current through that conductor if the physical properties of the conductor are constant. And when I say physical properties, what I mean is stuff like the temperature of the conductor, the length, the cross-sectional area, the material that it's made out of. A more symbolic way to say it is that potential difference is proportional to the current for a metallic conductor with constant physical properties. So this idea is already kind of buried in our definition of resistance. Remember our definition of resistance is R is equal to V over I. And if we rearrange that we get V equals I R. So you can see that if R is a constant, if resistance is a constant, then V is proportional to I. Which is what we're saying in Ohm's law. The problem is, and this is an important point, it turns out that R is not always constant. And that brings us to the next idea of ohmic and non-ohmic behavior. So ohmic behavior follows Ohm's law. Ohmic behavior is a situation where V is proportional to I. So the potential difference across a thing is proportional to the current through the thing. In the case of ohmic behavior, the resistance of the element is constant. And if we were to draw a graph of the potential difference across this element versus the current through the element, we'd get a graph like this, a simple linear graph that goes through the origin. And in this situation, the gradient of the graph is equal to the resistance of the element. Non-ohmic behavior is where the potential difference across the element is not proportional to the current through the element, and the resistance of that element varies. And the graph of it would look like this. So we have V versus I, and you can see it is not a linear graph. It still goes through the origin, but it's not a linear graph. And if we wanted to find the resistance, well, the resistance varies with the current passing through the element. So for example, at this point, 
the resistance would equal whatever the potential difference is across it divided by whatever the current is through it. And then the resistance over here would be whatever the potential difference is across it over whatever the current is through it, but it's not going to be the same value. And in this situation, the resistance is not equal to the gradient of the graph. So why would this occur? Why would non-ohmic behavior happen? Well, microscopically, the way that we would explain this is that as the current increases, there will be more electrons flowing through the element, the resistor, whatever it is. If there's more electrons traveling through it, then there's going to be more collisions between the electrons and the atoms in the resistor. If there are more collisions, then the electrons are going to be transferring more energy to these atoms. The atoms are going to gain energy, and they're going to gain kinetic energy. They're going to move more. But because they're fixed inside of this resistor, they're going to vibrate more. And if you remember back to thermal physics, if we have little atoms and they're vibrating more, that means that the temperature is going to increase. And as the temperature increases and they vibrate more, it turns out they're going to interfere with the electrons even more as the electrons pass through, and so the resistance increases. So the net effect of this is that as the current increases, those little molecules move around faster and the temperature increases, and so the resistance of the resistor increases. This is a common thing to see in filament light bulbs, because if you imagine an old style light bulb with a little filament in it, as current passes through that filament and the light bulb lights up, the temperature of that filament increases, and it turns out that the resistance of that filament also increases. The next topic we'll look at is variable resistors. Variable resistors are resistors that are designed to have a variable resistance. Duh. So the general symbol that we use for that is this. And a common type of variable resistor is just imagine you have a resistor, you have one end right here, and then you have a little movable wire that you move along this resistor. So if I have the little wire right here, the current's only going to pass through a little bit of the resistor, and so I'll have less resistance in my circuit. If I move this little movable wire over here, then the current's going to pass through more of the resistor, and it will provide more resistance in the circuit. And then if I move the end of the movable wire way over here, then I'll get a lot of resistance, and I'll have more resistance in my circuit. All right. Now, kind of the exotic types of variable resistors are things like thermistors. A thermistor is a resistor where the resistance varies with the temperature of the resistor. And usually we have a situation where as the temperature increases, the resistance of the resistor decreases. The symbol looks like this. And the model for this is that as the temperature increases in the resistor, more electrons become freed from the atoms that are in the resistor. And so we have more charge carriers available and it's easier for the current to flow through the resistor. So the graph would kind of look like this for a common type of thermistor. Temperature here, resistance here. As the temperature increases, the resistance of that resistor decreases. Now this is called an NTC, a negative temperature coefficient uh, thermistor. Turns out there are kinds called positive temperature coefficient thermistors. Those are thermistors where, as the temperature increases, the resistance increases. So that's kind of the classic non-ohmic resistor, except thermistors are a special type where it's more exaggerated than a filament lamp. So as the temperature increases, the resistance increases rapidly. Another type of variable resistor is a light-dependent resistor, or LDR. And its symbol is like this, kind of looks like light shining on a resistor. And in this situation, if you have more light incident upon the resistor, there's going to be less resistance in the resistor. The idea here is that the light shining or incident upon the resistor ejects electrons from the resistor or the atoms inside the resistor, which creates more charge carriers, which means that there's less resistance. And the graph we could draw here is that as the light intensity increases, the resistance of the resistor decreases. Last one we'll look at is called a potentiometer. A potentiometer has three terminals. It's a three terminal resistor with a moving contact. So the drawing of it looks like this. Uh, it's a little bit like we looked at that variable resistor at the beginning, but now we have three contacts. So let's put this into a circuit and see what would happen. So let's have a nine volt EMF and then we'll have the potentiometer over here. 
And the idea is we're going to have this other resistor, not the potentiometer, another resistor, just like a regular old resistor, and we want a specific potential difference across it. And what, can, what we can do is we can move the little wire of the potentiometer, and if we move the little wire of the potentiometer to different locations, we can get different potential differences across that resistor. So for example, let's say we take that little movable wire and we move it all the way to the top of the potentiometer. If we do that, this is essentially a parallel circuit. The EMF of the cell is 9 volts, so there's 9 volts across this potentiometer, and there's also 9 volts across our little resistor over here. But if I move that movable end of the potentiometer all the way to the bottom, I'm going to get a different PD across my little resistor over here. So if I move it all the way to the bottom, there's going to be zero volts across this little resistor over here. And if I move that movable end to right in the middle of the potentiometer, well, I'm going to get 4.5 volts across my little resistor over here. And I could move it to a place right up here, maybe it'd be six volts up here, and I could move it all the way down here and be maybe three volts across this little resistor here. But the point is, as I move this movable end across the potentiometer, I can get different PDs across this resistor over here. And the last thing we'll look at is internal resistance of a cell or battery. So, so far when we've looked at cells and batteries, we've considered them to be ideal. They just provide a PD, great. Not surprisingly, they're not ideal. Uh, in a real cell, the chemicals or whatever physical parts we have inside of the cell or battery cause imperfections, which reduce whatever potential difference is actually available from the cell or battery. So the model that we use to represent a real cell is this. So we've got this cell right there, we've got this little resistor right here, and I'm going to draw a dotted line around it. What this represents is that is the ideal cell right there. And then right here, this little resistor is called the internal resistance. I'll talk about that in a moment. And everything within the dotted line is everything inside of the real battery. So this internal resistance, let's go back to that. It's a way to include the imperfections of a cell. Now it's not a real resistor. If you open up a cell or a battery, you're not going to find a tiny little resistor that someone snuck in at the factory. It's a way to model the imperfections of a real resistor. The internal resistance is often small, and it's often negligible, but not always. So let's imagine that we have a real circuit. Let's draw this real cell inside of a real circuit. So here's our real cell. Everything inside the dotted line is what's actually in a cell. And then we'll have a resistor connected to that real cell. So let's see. If I have a voltmeter set up across the ends of the real cell, let's think about what it would measure. Well, here's the EMF, right? That's the ideal EMF that we should get from our cell. And the EMF here is going to equal, well, whatever potential difference is lost across this uh, resistor out here, plus whatever potential difference is lost across the internal resistance. So we're left with this expression. The EMF is equal to PD across the resistor plus the PD across the internal resistance. And the current is the same throughout this whole circuit because it's all in series. So the EMF is equal to I times capital R, the big resistor that's outside the real cell, plus I times little r, the current times the internal resistance that's inside of the real cell. And then we can rewrite this as the EMF is equal to I times R plus R, which is an expression that's given in your data booklet.